Melbourne, with a total population now exceeding three millions, is beset today by the same traffic problems that have overtaken most of the world's big cities. Every day, there's a large-scale movement of people into the city each morning and their exit at the end of the working day. Melbourne is not a residential city, most of its citizens living in the widespread suburbs surrounding the central business district. The southern boundary of the city is the Yarra River, and four bridges feed traffic from the south into the heart of the city. Prince's Bridge, Queen's Bridge, King Street Bridge and Spencer Street Bridge offer motorists entry to the very centre of the city from the south. And the ever-increasing concentrations of traffic on the feeder routes leading to these river crossings is making it more and more difficult for motorists to reach their places of work. Associated with this concentration of motor vehicles, which are often stationary for long periods with their engines idling, is the increasing problem of atmospheric pollution. The Spencer Street Bridge at the southern end of the city area carries not only traffic into and out of the city, but offers the best traffic route for motorists wishing to reach the western suburbs by the shortest possible road route. Melbourne's traffic problem is therefore due largely to the fact that the greater proportion of road traffic must pass through the central city area in order to negotiate crossings between the eastern, southern and western suburbs. There was the alternative of the Williamstown Steam Ferry Service which has celebrated its centenary. This vehicular ferry which plied across the Yarra River near its mouth was a relic of a more leisurely bygone era. Once traffic crosses the Yarra, the Maribyrnong River is a further barrier. Shepherd's Bridge at the western end of Footscray Road is one of three bridges which carry traffic to the western suburbs. Consider the economic losses, the added pollution and the frustration that usually results from the attempt to travel from south of the Yarra through the city to Geelong Road during the day. There are numerous sets of traffic lights confronting the driver who wishes to reach the Geelong Road from Spencer Street Bridge regardless of the route he takes. And, in addition, there are many intersections to be negotiated. If he's unlucky enough, he'll be stopped by most of these lights. In 1967, a comprehensive traffic study was undertaken by the authorities' traffic consultants to determine the feasibility of a toll bridge near the mouth of the Yarra on the line of Route 9, following the reservation contained in the Board of Works interim planning scheme. Such a bridge would offer significant time savings for east-west traffic. A comparison of two cars starting off together from, say, St Kilda Junction and both destined for the west illustrates this point. The conception of this bridge took into consideration the connections determined by the Metropolitan Transport Study which commenced in 1964. This plan shows the route of Freeway 9 which includes the Westgate Bridge connecting to the Prince's Highway to the west of Melbourne and to the southeastern freeway east of the city. Freeways 3 and 5 on the western approaches and Freeway 14 on the eastern approach were also anticipated in this plan and provisions were made for suitable connections to all major arterial roads. The analysis of traffic on these roads revealed that on opening in, say, 1965, the new bridge would divert more than 40,000 vehicles from alternative routes through and near the city every working day. The Lower Yarra Crossing Authority, a non-profit company, was registered in 1965 and granted a franchise by the Victorian government to build and operate a tolled crossing. 
The authority, which represented a wide field of interests, including banking, insurance, engineering, and heavy industry, appointed Mr. Oscar Meyer, formerly chairman of the Western Industries Association and Railways Commissioner, as its chairman. It became the responsibility of this board of directors to plan the details of a toll bridge which would amortize its cost over a maximum period of 40 years. Mr. Cecil Wilson was appointed general manager of the authority with the responsibility for the planning, construction, operation and maintenance of the project. For the private motorist of the future and for those who are engaged in the transport, haulage and delivery industries, the Westgate Bridge will be a major boon. The Lower Yarra Crossing Authority building was completed in 1971. It was erected on what had been a 20 feet deep garbage dump and now houses the staff of the authority. Melbourne's motorists of the future find a visit to the authority's model room an interesting school project. They learn that the Westgate Bridge is Victoria's largest and boldest engineering venture to date. Many hundreds of school children have already visited this building. The authority building overlooks the toll plaza situated on the east side of the bridge. This is the project's nerve center, where traffic flow will be monitored and controlled with the aid of closed-circuit television cameras and in conjunction with an IBM 1800 computer to ensure the smooth running of the entire complex. The bridge is equipped with its own electrical substation and switching equipment. An auxiliary power generating system automatically takes over should the supply fail. Standby water pumps come into operation should the main supply fail. 107 emergency telephones have been installed at strategic points across the bridge and its approaches. At night, high pressure sodium lanterns set atop lighting masts up to 120 feet high provide one of the most advanced lighting systems to have been installed anywhere in the world. The toll plaza is built on a reinforced concrete slab supported by 2,000 Frankie piles on the old rubbish dump. The toll cost for those using the bridge will be more than compensated for by the elimination of all those traffic lights, intersections and frustrations, the reduction in fuel consumption and above all, the savings in time by all those who need to travel regularly between the eastern and western areas of the city. On the west side of the bridge, several big oil tanks had to be removed and relocated to make way for the crossing. It was necessary also to realign the course of Stony Creek. 2,400 feet of creek diversion was needed. As the bridge alignment cut through portion of Nine Hole Spotswood Golf Course, part of the course was relocated, the result being an overall improvement to the course. Monsell and Partners of Melbourne and Freeman Fox and Partners of London were appointed joint consulting engineers for the main bridge crossing. Sir Gilbert Roberts, the responsible partner for Freeman Fox, with representatives of Monsell, discussed the details of the project with the authority. At a press conference called by the authority, the detailed plans for the bridge were publicly announced by Mr. Oscar Meyer. Technical questions were answered by the authority's general manager, Mr. Cecil Wilson, at this briefing. A comprehensive survey of the geological structure of the soil, sand and basalt rock beneath the proposed route of the bridge and its approaches was carried out. This involved drilling at various depths to obtain an accurate picture of the stratified geological structures of the terrain down to the underlying volcanic rock. With the evidence of these core samples, it was possible to design cylinder foundations and spread footings on which the crossing would be erected. Carefully labelled, the cores were stored to provide information essential to the design engineers in their planning of adequate foundations. In April 1968, the work of construction was started officially at a ceremony at Fisherman's Bend. Premier Sir Henry Bolte, after speaking about the tremendous benefits that will accrue to Melbourne with the completion of the bridge, 
officially started the drilling operations. The bridge is supported by 23 reinforced concrete piers which carry the concrete viaducts and four reinforced concrete piers to support the central steel spans. The piers of the western abutment are supported on spread footings to rock. The piers reach a maximum height of 156 feet for the central spans. The program for the construction of the cylinder foundations for the eastern abutment was developed by Frankie Pyle Constructions in association with the John Holland Company. In stage one, the first section of a steel cylinder with a sharp cutting edge is driven through the silt in the Frankie Pyle driving frame. The cylinder is driven into the ground by a diesel hammer. Generally, the first three 30 feet long cylinders are driven down through the soft upper layers prior to grabbing out the material from the interior. Following grabbing the cylinder is extended and the upper surface of the rock layer is chopped to ensure a key into sound rock. Then the inside of the cylinder is cleaned by an airlift. The bottom of the cylinder is then sealed by placing a concrete plug through a tremie pipe. After plugging the base of the cylinder, it's dewatered and a reinforcing cage placed in the tube and concreted. Some individual cylinders were test loaded by jacking against concrete Kentledge blocks. So the plan for the sinking of the cylinder foundations went into action. The engineers in charge of these operations knew exactly what to expect at each level of the strata beneath the pile sites as a result of their examination of the library of drill cores taken during the site research program. The cylinders consisted of five feet diameter fabricated steel tubes in 30 feet lengths, generally of half inch wall thickness, but increased to one inch thickness over the lower length. In all, more than 2,000 tons of fabricated steel casings were used during the construction of the piles. To reach solid rock, some of the pile casings extended down to a depth of 200 feet. During the pouring of each cylinder, vibrators were used to achieve compaction. Certain piles in specific areas where the pounding layer of basalt is comparatively thin were selected for a special test loading. Loads of up to 1,500 tons of Kentledge were used for this purpose. The Kentledge was carried on specially designed grillage over the pile. As the jacking load on the pile was increased, readings of settlement on the pile head were taken on strain gauges and a dumpy level. The required test load was maintained on the pile for a minimum of 24 hours. After this period, the load was removed by reducing the jack loads in stages. This was the scene at Fisherman's Bend at the time construction commenced in April 1968. The area encompassed a 20 feet deep garbage dump. Parallel with the sinking of the test bores and the construction of the pile foundations, the area was leveled and water holes and lagoons filled. The conversion of this area by the building of the Westgate Bridge has removed one of Melbourne's worst eyesores. The desolate and swampy area will be extensively landscaped and by 1974 a total of more than 95,000 shrubs and trees will have been planted here. $1,800,000 was spent on the alteration of utility services. The undergrounding of overhead electric cables and their relocation was carried out by the State Electricity Commission. 
A total of $2 million was spent on the acquisition of land for the Lower Yarra Crossing Authority. This required the removal of a number of old factory buildings. Work commenced on the relocation of a section of the Spotswood Golf Course, which was renamed the Westgate Golf Course. With the completion of the bridge foundations, each group of piles was capped and the erection of the piers commenced. The challenge to the contracting company of the development of an efficient construction method which did not involve expensive cranes was met. Twenty-seven high piers or columns will support the concrete spans and the central steel spans. They're of cellular cross-section and of heights up to 156 feet. Four piers will have fixed bases and the remaining 23 will incorporate rocker bearings top and bottom. At the high levels, concrete was lifted by kibbles, but most of the concrete up to these levels was pumped through four-inch lines connected to the side of each pier during its construction. The piers were constructed in eight feet lifts using a self-climbing formwork system achieving the placement of 25 cubic yards per lift up to the maximum height of 156 feet. Each lift was carried out in a four-day cycle. Reinforcement material was air winched to the climbing form and installed after each section had been completed. The extent of the repetitive work involved in the construction of the 27 pier columns resulted in the application of production engineering programs which speeded up the construction. A total of 18 cylinders were sunk in the Arab bed for each of the river piers. As each unique problem was overcome, results ensured that the contract works were completed within the program time. The concrete bridge work is built up with precast spine units which are post-stressed and which will support precast cantilevers or wings which are also post-stressed. Ducts through which the stressing cables pass are cast within each spine unit. The reinforced units were cast on the site. Two highly mechanized casting yards were established, one on the east side of the river and a smaller yard on the western side. A major task facing the contractor was the manufacture in correct sequence and the transport of the large number of very heavy units, some weighing up to 125 tons each. The size and weight of these concrete bridge components combined with the poor bearing capacity of the public roads favoured the installation of the on-site casting yards. The production program here called for the manufacture of 1,254 precast concrete units in 76 weeks from the establishment of the yards. 46,000 tons of concrete had been used in the two yards by the time the contract had been completed. The prefabrication of the reinforcement cages in a jig to very close tolerances was a key innovation responsible for the high production rates achieved in the yards. Each cast unit was steam cured under a metal cover before being moved to storage areas. Each span of the bridge spine is made up with a diaphragm unit, two diaphragm wing units and 17 spine units of the same basic shape but with web thicknesses varying from 10 inches to 20 inches.
with variations in reinforcement, cable duct location and cable anchorage blisters. Every two units except the five in the center of the span are in some way different. During the entire casting program only two units were rejected. In a second area on the east side casting yard, reinforced precast cantilevers were produced concurrently with the spine units. The cantilevers, or wings, are mounted one on each side of each spine unit to achieve the required deck width on the bridge. A system of transporting, storing and handling the heavy concrete units achieved high efficiency in the safe storage identification and availability of each unit as it was required on the site. The authorities' design consultants conducted a test on a complete spine beam unit and its cantilevers. This unit is used to investigate the behavior of the cantilevers when fully loaded. These tests confirm the validity of the original design. A critical factor in the successful installation of the spine units was the design of the massive erection trusses. A model of the erection truss gives some understanding of the erection method. The truss was designed for the fully loaded condition with over 2,000 tons of precast units. The operation of launching the truss into the next span usually occupied three days and required two crews with radio contact between all parties. The size and weight of the components of the bridge introduced problems not previously encountered in bridge construction in Australia. The erection of a span commences with the hauling up of four spine units which are moved to the forward end of the erection truss. Now units are lifted from the rear end of the gantry. The complex method of assembling the various spine units which make up one span was developed by the contracting company's engineering division. The storage of the spine units in their order of requirement on pedestals either side of the delivery track resulted in a minimum loss of time during the erection of each 220 feet span. From early cycle times of 35 working days per span Constant revision and improvement of techniques resulted in a target time of 28 days per span being reached. The record cycle time achieved during the construction period was 24 days. Lifting the spine units into the trusses was a straightforward operation carried out with a crew of nine men. As many as nine units were positioned in one day. This work was carried out simultaneously on both sides of the river where each spine beam had its own constant curvature to which the truss launching rails were laid. Temporary props were placed in position under the previously erected spine beam until the stressing of the next spine beam span was completed. Close control over the stability of the truss was maintained during the first half of each erection cycle with each pier pinned top and bottom and the main diaphragm supporting the truss also pinned. 
This was achieved by careful engineering supervision and a very detailed bar chart prepared from a precedence diagram listing each activity which had to be carried out in any specific area. Each of the spine units weighed between 90 to 125 tons depending on its web thickness. The procedure developed into a very smooth operation once it was initially mastered. After each massive unit was lifted into the truss, it was positioned accurately in the truss with the units already placed to form the beam. After skating the unit to its approximate position using eight ton winches located in the nose of the truss, the unit was adjusted and packed up to the required level using 75 ton jacks. The VSL stressing system was used successfully throughout the erection of each span. A crew of three men made up the cables in the completed spine beams during slack periods or during wet weather. Eighteen strand cables up to 228 feet in length were used for stressing the spine spans. The cables were pulled through ducts cast in the spines and stressed to 240 tons. During all the operations of erecting the spans, the normal tests were carried out to ensure that all specifications were met with regular testing of concrete test cylinders and tensile tests on each coil of stressing strand. Following the stressing and grouting of each span, the erection truss was moved forward to the next pier. During the planning stages of this project, attention was given to the definition of potential safety hazards and measures were taken to minimize these hazards. These measures were then built into the temporary works and procedures from the outset. A site safety manual was prepared, dealing with safety management covering hazard control, safety policy and procedures and safety rules. This manual was issued to all engineering supervisory staff on the project. As a result, the safety record on the combined concrete bridge works and foundation contracts at Westgate was considerably better than the norm for the Australian construction industry. Quality control throughout the execution of the concrete foundation contracts covered the quality of reinforcing steel, the stressing strand, structural steel elements and in particular the concrete. The correctness of the techniques used in the placing and assembling of the products was carefully supervised. The dimensions of the various components individually and collectively were kept under strict supervision. The finish and appearance of the completed work received a great deal of consideration. Each cantilever unit was installed using special erection trusses. Cantilever installation generally followed two spans behind the completed spine beam. The twin cantilevers are stressed transversely on each spine unit. The viaduct superstructures with 13 spans on the east side and 10 spans on the west approach reached completion within the time specified for the contract. The contract called for the construction of 5,568 feet of concrete viaduct, 116 feet 6 inches wide. Precast concrete slabs were manufactured off-site. These were individually lifted and laid on special seals on the cantilever units. It's to the credit of the authority that its faith in the ability of an Australian company to carry out large works of this nature resulted in the award of the contract to a local company, a contract worth approximately $12 million. The contract was completed within the agreed time to the satisfaction of the consulting engineers and the Lower Yarra Crossing Authority. A reinforcing mat was placed on the erected slab, then three inches of in-situ concrete achieved continuity of the slabs over the cantilevers and connected the slabs to both the spines and the cantilevers. With the erection of high-strength railing, the work was completed on time after the contractors had been given an extension because of the delay caused by the collapse of a span in the adjacent steel contract. As a result of sound engineering technology and high rates of production, 
The project received the 1972 Construction Achievement Award. Part two of this film will cover the steel contract, the construction of the central spans of the bridge, and the final commissioning of the crossing. <laughs>